Excellent. Okay. Welcome, everybody. This is Khaled Al Juhani. I'm an intervention cardiologist and social media ambassador for structural heart disease catheter based therapy in 2020 virtual meeting sponsored by King Fahad Armed Hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, today, I have the privilege and the honor to meet and discuss uh, virtually with Dr. Cohen, uh, who is uh, a world-renowned cardiologist, a professor of medicine at the University of uh, Missouri, Kansas City, an interventional and structural cardio cardiologist uh, with uh, expertise in cardiovascular outcome and health services uh, research. He's a renowned author of over 450 original article by himself. Uh, today, we're going to discuss uh, some of the challenges uh, we face as interventionalists uh, during implanting a valve in a previously implanted uh, surgical valve. First of all, Dr. Cohen, welcome uh, to our Thank meeting. You. Thanks, for, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not with you, you there in person, but uh, Zoom is the next best thing. Very good. So uh, what would be the first transcatheter heart valve system to choose, having now a variety of companies competing to uh, organize the best device, with, with, which one would be the best uh, for valve in valve procedure? So we're speaking yeah, specifically about valve in valve. So uh, in the United States, and, and you know, we have two main valves that are approved for use in valve in valve. We have Medtronic core valve, or now the Evolute, uh, Evolute R, um, or the, uh, uh, the Sapien balloon expandable platform from Edwards. Uh, those are the only two that uh, you know, are, are currently approved for that, um, and it really provides the bulk of the data. Um, I will say that, you know, I mean, honestly, at this point, both are very reasonable, although they have, uh, you know, just as in native valves, they have distinct advantages and disadvantages. Um, the core valve, the self-expanding valve with a super annular design, does have some advantages um, that we particularly like in valve and valve, um, which is, again, the lower gradients. Um, high residual gradients is a particular problem, especially when you get down into the smaller valves, the uh, uh, you know, valves that are labeled, labeled sizes of uh, 23 and definitely 21 and 19 millimeters, which um, you know, we see a fair number of coming back uh, with problems from sur surgical valves. And so there are some advantages of uh, the core valve uh, platform in those types of uh, scenarios. Um, but we also can use uh, the, the balloon expandable valves uh, in those places uh, as well. Um, but it's a little bit harder to get an optimal hemodynamic result. And we can talk about uh, some of the techniques that have been developed to try to do that. Excellent. And how would you choose the sizing of these valves in relation to or comparison to uh, native valves? Is it of any difference? And would... Uh... Yeah, I think it's, you know, the, the important things, uh, you know, to... It, 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 it is different. It's, you know, and we typically rely, you know, I think everybody in the world, uh, there are things that interventional cardiologists uh, disagree on or have different styles for, but I think everybody in the world uses the same app to figure out which valve to, uh, you know, to, to implant in a surgical valve. And thanks, you know, to Vinny Bapat and his team uh, in, in London originally, um, who developed that valve and valve app that really, you know, took detailed measurements of the sizes and specifications of all of the surgical valves out there uh, and made some pretty concrete recommendations as to sizing. So we really, you know, rely on that app, both for sizing as well as for positioning. Uh, the difference is um, that we now have, you know, one technique that really was not present when he first developed that app, which is the valve fracture technique. Um, and that does tend to, um, you know, make us sometimes modify the size of the valve that we choose. If we're planning on fracturing a valve, then we may choose a slightly larger valve size um, because we plan on it getting getting bigger. That you know, the valve and valve app, the recommendations that, that it makes uh, are not assuming that you're going to fracture the valve. But if you fracture the valve with a bioprosthetic valve fracture procedure, uh, and you can generally implant you know implant uh, a you know one size larger valve in order to really take advantage of that, uh, the superior hemodynamics. Very good. And that's actually brings me to the next question about fracturing a valve. Would you recommend it or not? Or you just reserve it specifically for certain cases like small annular? So it's definitely, you know, so this is a technique that we, you know, I mean, I don't, we didn't honestly, you know, pioneer. We weren't the first people to do it, but we, we and, and by we, I mean, my uh, uh, partners uh, at uh, St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in particular, Adnan Chatrawala, are the director of structural intervention there, and Keith Allen, who's our uh, surgical director of structural intervention uh, there, really 
pioneered this by doing a lot of bench research, you know, testing the different valves to see which ones can and can't be fractured, seeing how they actually um, uh, respond. So our general approach is um, any small valve, any small surgical valve that we're treating, 21 or 19 millimeters, we are, you know, basically go in and, and, and often in a 23, because again, the internal diameter tends to be millimeters smaller than this. We often go in with a plan that we are going to be doing valve fracture. Um, and in most of the cases, we do that in order, you know, for two things, number one, to minimize the gradient. Uh, and number two, we believe that by doing the valve fracture, we're optimizing the valve expansion and then allowing the, the leaflets of the TAVR valve to function more normally and hopefully then, then be, uh, be more durable. Um, the way we, you know, the way that we do it in our, in our practice is um, that we always do the fracture after the, the TAVR valve is implanted. There are sites that like to do the valve fracture first to make sure that they've actually been able to do the fracture. There are some theoretical concerns about that, however, in particular uh, related to if you, you know, really tear a leaflet and you can give a patient profound aortic regurgitation if you do the valve fracture before implanting the TAVR valve. And as a result, um, you know, then you really have to rush uh, to implant your, your, your TAVR valve. We don't wanna be rushing. And so we always implant the, the TAVR valve first we assess the gradient after the TAVR valve is in. And if the gradient is significant and significant for us means greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, then we proceed with valve fracture as long as it's an appropriate uh, surgical valve that can be fractured. So, you know, we, we try to plan ahead for that um, and, uh, you know, incorporate that very, you know, very much into our practice, but we don't fracture all the valves. I mean, again, if you've got a large valve, a 25 millimeter surgical valve, you may have, you know, a perfectly fine gradient just by, you know, implanting the valve, the, the, the TAVR valve itself. And then, you know, obviously there are risks. There's no, you know, no free lunch uh, in this world. And so every uh, additional procedure we do expose the patients to risk of stroke, uh, you know, can cause, um, you know, rupture, other complications, valve embolization, all these things have been, you know, have been reported, coronary obstruction. And so all of those types of things uh, make us, you know, we, we, we have to know we're accomplishing some benefit. Uh, in order to justify taking the risk of doing a valve fracture. Moving to the most uh, feared complication of tavern implantation and valve and valve, and specifically in certain surgical valve like the mitral flow and trifecta, uh, mm -hmm. the coronary obstruction from the pre-existing uh, leaflet. Uh, uh, how would we avoid it, number one, and would we do a routine basilica procedure that is uh, innovative uh, to right. prevent and reduce the risk of uh, obstruction? So that, I mean, so you're right that that, you know, in valve and valve tavern, that really is, you know, along with stroke, that's the, you know, those are the two, um, you know, really severe complications that we, uh, that we worry about. Um, and, you know, for coronary obstruction, we have, you know, we, we have two basic procedures that we can do to, uh, you know, to limit its consequences or to avoid it. Uh, coronary protection by placing, you know, a wire and a prophylactic stent in the, uh, you know, in the LAD usually, uh, prior to imp uh, implanting the TAVR valve so that we're in a position to rescue um, if coronary obstruction occurs or becomes imminent by, uh, you know, making a, a snorkel uh, uh, pathway uh, alongside the, uh, the frame of the, the, the TAVR valve. And we still do that, you know, a modest amount. We have not, you know, we, we generally have not had to, uh, uh, to use that technique or, you know, or to deploy that stent. Um, but it's, you know, it's good to know it's there um, if you're worried about, if you're sort of moderately worried about obstruction, I would say. If you're very worried about obstruction, and, you know, that occurs in particular when you look at this distance between the frame of the, uh, uh, the uh, existing TAVR valve um, with external leaflets and the coronary ostium, if that's less than about, you know, uh, you know, three or four millimeters, then you start to get worried. And especially if you're going to be doing a valve fracture procedure and you're going to be uh, growing the valve. In those cases, you know, there's, there can be a very high likelihood of obstruction. In those cases, uh, we would, you know, strongly consider doing a basilica procedure. I mean, basilica, as you know, is not a trivial procedure to do. It takes, a, you know, a lot of uh, expertise. It takes, you know, imaging, it uh, takes experience with, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, um, you know, wires and shaping the wires, but the techniques have now, you know, by uh, really the very hard work of folks like, uh, you know, Adam Greenbaum, who's now in Atlanta, um, and uh, the group uh, in at the Washington Hospital Center, um, Javar Khan, I mean, who have really done a lot of work really uh, exploring um, the, the mechanisms of, of, of this technique. Um, it's pretty well established. We kind of know the steps to go through, but it is a, you know, a cumbersome, not a trivial technique, getting the guide positioned in the right place, uh, making the, you know, the proper 
slice uh, with electrocautery. All the steps are, you know, are, are very critical, but it does seem like a safe procedure. And, you know, absolutely. And if you've got a leaflet that is really close to the coronary ostium and you're pretty sure it's going to cover it uh, entirely when you put a valve in valve in, um, doing a prophylactic uh, uh, procedure is probably a good idea. Excellent. And to our last question about the ideal implanta implantation depth that, uh, as we know, that you want to aim as high as possible. Right. Will not embolize the valve yet. You don't want to implant deep so you can cause a pacemaker. Uh, exactly. So a pacemaker is very low, you know, is a very low concern in valve and valve. That's, I mean, the one thing that it almost never happens um, with, with valve and valve, I think, because the existing frame kind of protect you, you know, you really can't damage the annulus uh, the way that you can with a, a, a native valve uh, a, a taver. Um, but, you know, the, I think, you know, the, the goal is, as you know, to implant whatever valve you're implanting, to pl implant it as high as possible, but not too high um, for that. The good news, I think, with especially with the development of, you know, that was really important before we had the valve fracture procedure. Then you really, you know, especially if you're trying to use a superannular device, I mean, you wanted to get that as high as possible so that it could uh, expand more up in the sinuses as opposed to down in the in the uh, uh, the native ends. Um, now that we have the ability to do the valve fracture procedure, um, it's less of, you know puts less of a premium on it. I think we can be a little safer on the depth, and we can take a depth of you know three, four, five millimeters. We don't have to aim for a zero zero implant depth uh, with uh, um, with with valve and valve taver, especially if we're if we're going to be using a, a a valve fracture procedure because we you know we buy. And what we've seen on the bench and what we see in practice is you get another, you know, three to four millimeters of growth in the annulus um, with fracturing the valve uh, for most of these. And then, you know, and so if you've got a, you know, even if you have a 19 millimeter uh, 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 surgical valve with a, you know, which has a 17 and a half or 18 millimeter internal diameter, if you fracture that, you're going to get up to around 21, 22. It's not so bad. These are generally small patients. They're elderly. Uh, so it's not, you know, we don't think it's that big of a deal. And I will say, and I will, you know, what we would really like to know uh, about valve and, fra valve and the valve fracture, you know, techniques is whether we're really producing benefit. We know we can reduce the gradient that, you know, we know we can grow the valve by doing that, but we don't have evidence yet that it improves clinical outcomes uh, in terms of, especially in terms of heart failure, hospitalization, and mortality. We are hoping to eventually study that in some of the valve and valve registries like the Vivid registry um, or the TBT registry, um, but we're still waiting to accumulate enough procedures to, uh, to study that. I don't think anybody's gonna ever gonna do a randomized trial on it. So we're gonna have to study, settle for registry data. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen, for common thoughts, and hopefully we'll have you uh, physically here in Saudi Arabia next year. I think that would be, I, I would love to come. I, I really hope the times will allow it. It would be nice to uh, see people in, in, in person and press the flesh and see, you know, see, see so many uh, new and old friends. So again, I really do appreciate the opportunity to contribute. Thanks for having me. Thank you.